Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you, uh, Sarah, too, for the kind invitation to come today. I was just, I was interesting, uh, I was just thinking when uh, Shane was speaking about the plastics free day or something you were talking about with the supermarkets. Uh, I remember doing that over 20 years ago, actually, uh, in my local supermarket. And as I, I think it was a, a Friends of the Earth initiative, unpacking all my shopping at the end of the aisle and handing it all back. Uh, just think times have changed. I got, uh, I got banned from that supermarket <laughs> uh, for doing that, uh, which is only half the story because actually at that time I was living on the Orkney Islands off the top of Scotland and that was the only supermarket <laughs> on the island. <laughs> so my wife did all the shopping after that. So. Anyway, it just shows you things, things have, uh, have, have changed. Uh, the other thing about, I was just going to say, sometimes he's teed up sometimes when I come along. Uh, here's this guy from Scotland going to tell us how fantastically wonderful everything is in Scotland, uh, as if it's some sort of different uh, universe and, you know, everything's great and that's what we should be doing. Uh, I don't know, I don't really think I'm going to do that uh, because actually what I've been listening to over the last uh, couple of sessions right from the start is, is really all of the elements uh, that we have in Scotland uh, in terms of our transition to a circular economy. Uh, it's, it's been talked about here from the sort of high level uh, gym at the beginning, the kind of policy, policy setting uh, right through to some of the initiatives on the ground, the, the passion uh, and the kind of dialogue that's going on with everybody in the room. That's it's exactly what's happening. I mean, you have all the elements uh, going on here and even in this fantastic building, you have an example uh, of what the circular economy is all about. So I'm not, hopefully not going to uh, sort of lecture to you about how wonderful Scotland does, but really just reflect on, on our journey uh, in terms of how we possibly just pull some of those elements together, uh, certainly into, into a national strategy uh, and taking a few things forward. Uh, but as I say, a lot, of, a lot of what I've heard is very similar to in, in what's happening in Scotland. In fact, the climate kick uh, Aideen, Aideen was talking about that. I mean, that's, that's something I've been involved in as well, uh, basically as a judge uh, of that in Scotland. Uh, and it's quite incredible to, to just see over the, certainly over the last couple of years, and, and this year as well, I've seen the, the, the people who have sort of bid in to, to be part of that programme in Scotland. There's, there's, there's now a majority of those sort of entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs coming forward, uh, are circular economy business models. So there is this kind of trend uh, coming forward with people thinking about the circular economy and devising or certainly bringing forward business uh, opportunities around the circular economy. Uh, so there is a trend. So it is happening. It's not just happening in Scotland. I can hear it's happening here in Ireland as well. Uh, just, just to reflect on that, it's just not something that's unique. Uh, I, I read a report this morning. Others might have seen it on the internet around the... the Somebody's done a global report on the top businesses or the, the emerging businesses over the last couple of years uh, that have been really successful. Why have they been successful? What are the common traits across these businesses? And obviously we can think of the big ones like Uber uh, and Airbnb and some of those kind of big companies, uh, big organisations coming forward. And those traits, if I read them out, there's six traits and they've all been reflected in the conversations already today are about personalisation. So not just knowing your broad customer base, but the individual customer and what their needs are. Uh, closed loop, all the idea of the circular economy in terms of using resources more sparingly or, or maximising that opportunity with the, the, the resources. Asset sharing, all of the, we know about that, using platforms that we can share, again, like Uber. Uh, Usage-based charging, so the whole idea of paying for a service. Uh, rather than ownership, collaborative ecosystems, the whole idea how businesses work together. And finally, agility, so that's using the kind of internet of things or uh, new technology to, to make things happen much quicker and much more direct to the customer. So the, the, that, that's what's happening now in the world. That's where business is going. Successful businesses uh, that we see at a global level are now running with those traits in them. So this circle economy is happening. Uh, so I know Shane will say, what, what does this mean for Ireland? Uh, should we get on board uh, or whatever? And I guess it's the same argument for Scotland and other countries. It's happening. The circular economy is happening. Now you can say whether you like it or not, but I think everybody likes it. That's what we are certainly hearing from business community 
uh, and much broadly people are beginning to get excited about this uh, and wanting to come on board and it's something that is, is it's fun uh, I'll say a bit more about that in terms of the community what, uh, organisations we work with and the support for some of their initiatives people are really beginning to enjoy this and business people that we work with a lot are really uh, feeling uh, enabled or, or empowered by this whole idea of the circular economy it's breaking them out of a kind of competitive silo mentality where they go into they go into huddles with other people in their sector and everybody's a bit guarded uh, about what they're doing uh, for obvious reasons but actually the circular economy allows them to come out of that and talk across sectors with different people and actually collaborate about stuff that they really feel passionate about and I think that's really helping uh, community uh, sorry business leaders particularly or people in business uh, to take this forward. So it's just, just a little bit about Zero Waste Scotland that has been teed up by uh, Anna already but yeah we are a government funded uh, agency, I guess, organisation in Scotland uh, to take forward uh, the ambitions that the Scottish Government have uh, in terms of the circular economy. We are, uh, just, uh, just to put it in context, we have about 110 staff working at Zero Waste Scotland. We have an annual budget of about, well, £25 million, so I assume it's a kind of almost one-to-one -one thing with euros. Uh, it's about 25, 26 million euros. Uh, a lot of that is about investment and I'll talk a bit about that as well, uh, but as I say we're, not, we're on a number of programmes uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government and a number of sectors as well. It's interesting, I put the, obviously we align to the sustainable development goals and uh, I know a lot of things have been talked about, about the environment and sustainability and social justice and uh, we're very, very clear that the work that we do in terms of zero waste and circular economy has got that uh, regenerative uh, opportunity as well around our economy, not just in Scotland but across the world in terms of consumption patterns and our impacts on climate change. Uh, again, this morning, uh, announcement in Scotland, Scotland has a population of just over 5 million. One in five people in Scotland live in poverty. One in five. One in four children in Scotland live in poverty. That's staggering. Now, we can all have a debate about the, the terminology of poverty, but that's, that's quite a striking thing uh, for a nation uh, in what we call the developed world. So this is as much about creating opportunity, uh, not just protecting the environment, but real opportunity in terms of economics at a local level, as well as a macro level, as well as a global level. This is about what really matters uh, to people on the ground. Uh, so a lot of our work is very much framed in that. So just a little bit about the context where we came from. So we had a zero waste plan in 2010 and we thought the, the answer was this, sort of uh, forming, uh, looking at our basically recycling system and creating a new dynamic. So put some regulations in, make it compulsory for everybody to recycle, which we now have. All businesses have an obligation to recycle materials, key materials, including food waste. We put in a recycling charter, which would kind of create this idea of, an, of, a, of a grid, a resource grid, like you've got an energy grid. Uh, and a water grid which kind of provides a consistency of supply, we would, we would ask all the councils to kind of align their services or their recycling services to a common theme uh, and we would generate uh, a great pool of material, consistent material of quality uh, into our economy. Uh, obviously the MRF code uh, would help that uh, and ultimately we would aggregate these materials and really try and generate them into the economy uh, as best we can. Uh, there's obviously some some challenges around that and that is still a, a direction of travel we're on. But underpinning that, or to some extent you could argue undermining that, uh, was some other larger issues that were going on, not just about the consistency of recycling services and how do you get consumers involved in that, uh, but there's obviously the climate change impacts of our waste system uh, are considerable. Uh, the plastics, well, as people have mentioned that already, and that's a very hot topic at the moment. Obviously, it's something that's been happening for years, as we all know. Uh, but the, the demonstration that, that the, the system that we have, if it's called a system, isn't working for us. So plastics leaking out of that system uh, into our, our oceans and our environment, causing huge impacts, uh, is something we really need to think about. And obviously, we don't have the, quite the dramatic... Uh, soil impacts that other parts of the world have, but yeah, our soils in terms of carbon uh, are in depletion, uh, is, are in depleting as well. Uh, in terms of material trade, that's very interesting. Uh, I mean, obviously, looking back a few years, uh, as well as we're increasing our recycling, our recycling rates increasing all the time, and 
taking stuff out, as I said, from businesses and consumers, but we export over 70%, nearly 75% of all the materials collected in Scotland for recycling are exported. So apart from organics and glass, most of the other materials are all sent out, whether that's to other parts of the UK, into uh, mainland Europe, possibly to Ireland uh, and out to the Far East, uh, which is all very good for the environment, but uh, evidence from uh, for evidence we've seen in the past is for every one job there is in the collection of materials for recycling, there's a further eight jobs in the reprocessing, remanufacture, repurposing, resell, reuse of those materials back in your economy. So in some respects we were exporting jobs, or we are exporting jobs, uh, and so there was an economic driver there. Uh, but there's also other reverse of that now in terms of what's happening. We've, somebody's mentioned China already uh, in terms of the flow of materials from our recycling systems. But also we're, we're experiencing obviously some geopolitical impacts, uh, particularly around Brexit, uh, in terms of the price of sterling. So, uh, and that has increased the cost of raw materials. So in a recent study, a Scottish Chamber of Commerce study, uh, looking at manufacturing, over 86% or 86% of uh, chief executives of our manufacturing businesses put at the top of their worries the price of raw materials. So again, these are real things that are happening in our economy, and that's why the circular economy for us uh, is very important. So that all, and obviously another thing we should just talk about or just mention is obviously food waste. So in terms of our consumption patterns, uh, there's nothing, you know, we can talk about plastics and electricals and all of the things and shopping and uh, and, and clothing uh, has been talked about already, but the way that we uh, consume our food or not consume our food, waste our food, uh, is something that we really need to address. So all of that came together uh, for the Scottish Government in our strategy that they re released in 2016, Making Things Last, which is our circular economy strategy, which was basically came out the back of uh, a long, felt a long time, maybe about two years of evidence gathering. So. Uh, taking on board uh, Shane's point again about the big numbers. Uh, so we all saw the trillion dollar numbers that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and McKinsey were putting around. And what we wanted to understand, well, what does that actually number mean to Scotland, to our economies? So we did a number of uh, pieces of work uh, around key sectors. Uh, and you obviously, uh, and to try and understand if we did something different. So we, instead of looking at recycling particularly, but looking at repurposing or reusing <coughs> materials. So. That was a, uh, something else that came out of the, the Green Alliance and uh, McKinsey work, just to try to show the impact economically of shifting to a different system away from recycling. So we looked at that for some key sectors, as you would. Uh, whiskey's already been mentioned. Why wouldn't we look at whiskey? Uh, it's one of our biggest industries. So we looked at whiskey, uh, beer, and fish, just three parts of our food and drink industry, uh, and recognised if we change the system, if we look differently about how we use byproducts and waste, uh, and used the kind of cross-fertilisation of these industries, there was a between 500 and 600 million pound economic benefit to those industries just by changing that system. And that's, that's because there's a hell of a lot of byproducts in these three industries, some of which is not termed waste, uh, but they're byproducts. Uh, there's 25 million tonnes of byproducts, bio-waste or bio-products coming out of our industries, not just in those, these three industries, across other things like forestry in Scotland. That's a huge opportunity. A lot of it is, is downcycled or, or sent to landfill, a whole variety of uh, other, other process uh, exit routes for it, but not high value. So that was an opportunity for us. Manufacturing. So we looked at remanufacturing. Uh, there was already some companies in Scotland who were doing remanufacturing. Uh, they didn't really call it that. They just did it. Uh, so we looked at them and we used their numbers and we extrapolated some of the opportunities around our manufacturing industries and recognised that we shifted uh, to a remanufacturing uh, structure in Scotland for some of those industries. There was about five and a half thousand new jobs could be created. Oil and gas, there's a huge decommissioning opportunity uh, happening in the North Sea uh, where equipment is coming back on shore from both subsea uh, and uh, top sides. Uh, of infrastructure. Now, the bulk of that will be recycled because a lot of it is obviously steel uh, and there's already a, quite a credible uh, supply chain for that. But if we started to reuse some of those bits of equipment or some of that technology or some of the equipment, the, the high value stuff that's coming off instead of recycling, there was a 15-fold uh, in terms of economic value for some of those uh, parts. So that again really grabbed attention for everybody. Uh, so our strategy really aligns around those 
opportunities in terms of the key sectors and key actions uh, that we're uh, all going to take uh, to make them a reality. But it is about business, uh, and it's about small businesses. Uh, a lot of, certainly the work that we, we went to see in uh, the Netherlands uh, and other countries that were sort of seen as leading in the circular economy, it was all big business that was doing that. Uh, and I'm probably very similar to no uh, Ireland. Uh, but over 99% of our businesses are SMEs. In fact, the bulk of them, over 80%, are small businesses, less than 15 people. Uh, so it was really important to us that we focused on SMEs and tried to understand what the opportunities were for them and how we could support them. So what we've done is providing a support uh, package. It's a service, basically, uh, to give it its, its normal title. Uh, it is about trying to provide a wraparound service for those businesses. Uh, trying to understand the ones that want to shift to the circular economy, uh, who have got an idea, how do we support them through identifying that opportunity, working up their opportunity, and ultimately getting to a point where uh, they're investable. So that might be by ourselves, and we have an investment fund. Uh, it's already been talked about. We have an £18 million uh, investment programme for those types of businesses, but it might be from other lenders as well, or other investors, uh, whether that's angel finance, or high street banks finance, or other types of finance. It doesn't have to be us. Uh, but we are there to invest in these companies. But we want to work with them. It's not just simply saying, here's a bag of cash. How do we develop the opportunities for those individuals, uh, startups, but also looking at traditional businesses uh, who understand that they would like to move, or there's a trend, or there's a bit of pressure from maybe their supply chain, or they just feel that this is something they want to take forward in the, the top right, top left hand corner, right hand corner, I can't see. Uh, that's Mackey's Transmission, which is a, is a very traditional uh, manufacturing business, which is now remanufacturing gearboxes uh, on behalf of a number of cars uh, makers, uh, very well uh, famous car makers as well. Uh, and they actually managed to remanufacture them to a better standard than new gearboxes coming out of the factory. And the companies that make these manufactured gearboxes know that, <laughs> but they're still quite happy to work with the remanufacturing uh, company in Mackey's as well. So these are real opportunities for us in Scotland. We also recognise that it's not just about businesses, it is about people, it's about citizens, it's about the individual uh, adopting or mainstreaming habits like reuse, repair, uh, sharing. So we're very, uh, we're working on our Zero Waste Towns initiative, which we've been going for a number of years now, where we provide support to individual community groups or collective, collective community groups uh, in particular areas of Scotland who have got a plan and want to take forward this idea. So we see this as not just a top-down or a business-led, this is about citizens and communities as well and certainly working with people like the Community Recycling Network in Scotland uh, has been a real bonus because they, they can organise themselves and provide support. And I know you have a, a similar uh, network here in Ireland. So the other part of this is how the collaborative nature uh, sits. So this is not just about Zero Waste Scotland, working with businesses, we work with our enterprise agencies, uh, with community groups, we work with, as I said, the, the community uh, NGOs as well on the ground. This is a very much uh, a collaborative approach uh, the other thing we're doing, though, is quite slightly uh, different from what we've done in the past, is a cities and regions approach. Uh, and I use that term quite loosely because uh, it started off with an initiative in Glasgow, but we're now beginning to roll that out across the other cities, as you would imagine, Aberdeen, uh, Perth, Dundee, uh, Edinburgh. But we're also looking at a uh, regional approach and even an island approach. So we're now working uh, with Orkney Islands Council uh, and even a smaller, Rathsey, a very small island just off Skye to look at a circular economy approach. Now, what this kind of came out of working with Glasgow uh, on basically uh, through the Chamber of Commerce, so again, using an existing network which already had a reach into industry uh, at a local level uh, and could actually bring everybody together to both socialise the idea of the circular economy, so, not to, so move it off from the diagrams and the fancy you know, uh, PowerPoint presentations to actually what that meant on the ground. But then what we did was a thing called a city scan, where we managed to map out uh, all of the resources in Glasgow. So we created a kind of three-dimensional model, which actually started to identify resources or waste uh, and how they moved around the city and where the opportunities were to kind of intercept them and create new opportunities. And that was a very visualisation. And that really helped get everybody around the table. Before that, it was about a concept and People have been sort of like Googling it and understanding a little bit more about it. But actually when we started to build these maps, uh, people started to understand what 
the real opportunities were, both in terms of a kind of spatial connectivity, uh, but also in terms of numbers uh, and value. And that's something I think that, uh, so for us, who have traditionally worked in a sector uh, approach, i.e. in terms of resource efficiency, you would go and work with the whisky industry or work with a key sector on a kind of common uh, issue that they might have around resource efficiency or a common opportunity to, to be more resource efficient. Uh, this was something new for us. This was really about creating a different local dynamic to the idea of collaboration uh, across different sectors. And I put that up. This is, I mean, you might have heard about our, our Beer from Bread initiative, uh, uh, Jaw Brew, uh, one of the breweries. And this came out of the work in Glasgow. Now, making beer from bread uh, is, is, is innovative, but there's a number of other people doing it. Uh, but what does, for us, really symbolise what the circular economy is about? Uh, because this was about a, a local brewery in Glasgow and all the bakers, a local bakers in Glasgow, who had never met each other. Although they worked in the food and drink industry at a local level, they'd never been in the same room together. So through the work that we did with the chamber, where we had uh, partnerships, we had workshops, we brought people together who were interested in this and socialising the idea. These people kind of met. Uh, they realised that, hold on a minute, we could make beer from your bread. You've got bread rolls at the, at the end of the day. Uh, and a lot of food waste issue in there, and that's something else we are addressing. Uh, but they've got a particular waste stream at the end of the day that the other person could use. Uh, so they've started to collaborate together. But not only was it those two people, so there's another issue about making beer from bread apparently in terms of the aperture of the pipes at the brewery. Uh, so then a local pipe manufacturer got involved as well and said, well, hold on, I can help. Or maybe we could look at how the pipe structure and the pump actually works to make sure the bread, which basically it's a bit gloopy uh, when it comes into the system, when it's added with water. Uh, but also then, they have a, how do you go and pick it up? So somebody's out in a car driving around all these bakers and they don't know how many rolls they're going to get. So then a logistical company with a digital platform came in with an app and said, well, hold on a minute, we could give all the bakers, all the bakeries this app and they could add how many rolls they've got at four o'clock and then they could, you know. And that's what the circular economy is all about. That would never have happened if we just approached it from a kind of traditional sector approach. And all of those people all collaborated together uh, to make this, this beer, which is now uh, selling very well, uh, I believe, uh, in Glasgow. Not that I've sampled it or anything, uh, <laughs> honestly. Uh, so it's just, so just this, this like kind of encapsulates some of the programs that we're running at the moment in terms of the circle economy. So it came out of the strategy. Uh, as I've said, we've, we've accessed some finance from Europe as well, I, I have to say. So uh, structural funds, ERDF. Uh, we put a bid in a number of years ago, uh, so that has been matched with Scottish Government money, so we're running. So that's basically investment fund, the dedicated one-to-one -one business support, which is all about a very bespoke uh, service for individual companies. Uh, we're, we're working with about 65-plus businesses at the moment uh, in a variety of sectors, uh, some of which I said we are identifying themselves as saying we're interested in the circular economy and, and startups and other ones we're approaching because we believe there's a real opportunity for them. So a lot of that is about how do we influence and, and, and get people on board. Uh, the Institute for Remanufacturing is very interesting for us. So, you know, that's working with Strathclyde University. So again, a very important part of this is, is academics and the R&D uh, interface that they can bring, uh, which again was something new for us. Uh, usually a lot of what we do in the past in terms of recycling and resource efficiency is work in the here and now in terms of businesses on the ground. But this is very much about trying to think about new technology, new advancements. How do you bring that into the workplace uh, to think more seriously about the circular economy? Uh, reuse and repair infrastructure, I mean, I talked a little bit about that, but we have a Revolve brand, uh, which we've been developing for a number of years now, so we're over 100 uh, uh, sort of credited stores across Scotland, and the real focus for that is to raise the profile of reuse and repair, so it's much more mainstream for both people, to uh, citizens to donate stuff, but more importantly, to go and buy things second hand, and there's a kind of mark of quality uh, in terms of uh, the product that they're buying, whether that's furniture, clothing, bikes, uh, electricals, uh, there's now a kind of uh, an accreditation system that sits behind that. Skills Academy, very important. Again, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the work in recycling uh, that we've done in the past, resource efficiency is all about the here and now, but what about the future? 
what skills will our society need if we become circular? If you're going to move yourself forward to 2025 and we're completely circular, what will have been the skills that the people will have had to have adopted uh, in the businesses that they're running and society more generally? So how do we get that back into uh, schools uh, in the first instance, but also into universities and into the manufacturing sector as well in terms of their skills development? So we work very hand in hand with Skills Development Scotland on that and Education Scotland. Uh, procurement training, that's been mentioned already. Again, we see, you know, I kind of sometimes say it's a sleeping beauty uh, of the circular economy. If we could really change public procurement uh, to a service-based model uh, rather than buying things, then that would really create the demand pool, uh, as people have said already, for the real market pool uh, for new enterprise models, uh, new circular enterprise models coming forward. So we work a lot with the procurement, identifying opportunities and working with the procurement people in terms of supporting them, mentoring them uh, through the identification and you know, changing uh, the approach to procurement, cities and regions. Another thing we're looking at is completely changing the system around recycling. I mentioned a bit about the system that we have, uh, and I think we have to accept, uh, particularly around plastics, that system isn't working, and we do need to think seriously about another one. So we are, as aligned to the European thinking around product stewardship, product responsibility, looking at how we can identify new frameworks uh, in Scotland to generate a different system approach in terms of both finance, ownership and transparency so we are all a little bit more uh, aware of what happens to our waste uh, or our products once we finish with them uh, and deposits legislation sits on that so I'm sure many will, will be aware that Scotland has committed to having a container deposit system uh, for beverage containers uh, in due course and we're working on that model uh, looking at existing models from around uh, the world, uh, mainly Europe as well, but hopefully adopting, well, design, we're going to design one specifically for the Scottish situation. So again, that is about changing the system uh, that uh, we have currently. And I think that's the point I was just going to kind of finish with. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the whole uh, system two thinking, uh, you know, the I don't know if you know that you have the different parts of your brain. Most people use, uh, or all of us really use, the emotional part of our brain, the kind of reactive brain, uh, the bit that tells us, makes things, makes decisions for us very quickly. Uh, a lot of that is around what we know uh, and then how, you know, how we react to our, our surroundings, the whole uh, fight or flight uh, scenario, and that's, that works very well. We're very happy with that. It's quick at problem solving. Uh, but actually the more deeper thinking, the system two thinking, is how do we engage the other part, which is more about being reflective, being analytical. Uh, and I know for a lot of people that's quite uncomfortable. It's not a place where a lot of people like to go in terms of that reflective thinking. It takes a bit longer uh, if people feel under pressure. But that's the bit that really, for me, talks, talks to the circular economy. We need to take that longer term view about all the systems. And that really is what we see the circular economy as this is a change of system. And that's a challenge, I think, for, for a lot of people, uh, particular, I think, a lot of people in the waste side of things, that this is different. This is a different way of thinking it. And sometimes you can't imagine what that system will look like, but it will be different, and we're beginning to see it already uh, in some of those trends and some of those business trends. Even you think about things like Airbnb and Uber, some of those trends we couldn't have imagined five years ago. We couldn't imagine snap smartphones 10 or 15 years ago. So this is about a new systems approach to what we're doing now. Uh, and I do think there are two conversations going on sometimes as well. Uh, and again, that can be quite uncomfortable. I spend a lot of time in traditional waste management meetings or traditional waste management events talking about recycling, talking about China, talking about the current system and how it needs to evolve. Uh, and then I, have other, I go to other events and I talk to a lot of business people, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of chief execs of uh, some of the bigger companies in Scotland uh, and they just they talk about the circular economy in a completely different way. They don't think it's anything to do with their waste that sits at the back door or their bin collection. Uh, they see this as an opportunity, a business opportunity, a different way of doing business and they get very excited about that. And I don't think sometimes these two things sit quite comfortably together uh, and we should be aware of that because it's not, it's not an either or. We need, to, we need to change the system but we need everybody to understand uh, that this is a shift. Uh, it was quite interesting when people talk about the circular economy package earlier uh, in terms of the European uh, framework that's, that's, that's coming through now. Because I have stood in meetings uh, with business leaders and talked about the circular economy package in Europe. And a lot of business leaders in Scotland haven't heard of it. 
and say, what's that got to do with us? And, they, and they're doing the circular economy. A lot of the businesses that we're working with, the 65 businesses, they don't understand what the circular economy package is all about. They're not part of that. That's not their space. But by heck, they're doing the circular economy and they're excited by the circular economy and they're going to create real economic opportunity in Scotland. And they're hoping to be able to export some of that technology around the world or that idea. So I just, again, I think that's a, a challenge around the system one, system two thinking. How do we bring it together uh, but ensure that we don't just think about how the current system needs to evolve, that actually there is a new dynamic going on out there. And if that's hopefully whetted your appetite about what's going on in Scotland, uh, please come uh, to Scotland. At the end of October, we are following in the footsteps of the Netherlands and Luxembourg, uh, and we've been lucky to secure the, uh, the Circle Economy hotspot, which is basically a, a come and see what we're doing in Scotland. Again, we're not trying to show that it's any better uh, uh, than anywhere else. Uh, we're on a journey. We can, we'll be exhibiting the companies that we're working with. There'll be a little scene setting, but it's basically about coming and seeing what's actually happening. So this is a come and see opportunity rather than a come and listen. Uh, and the businesses that we're working with will be on show. So please come along. It, it, I think it fits around the same time as the climate kick thing that uh, uh, was talked about before in Edinburgh, so if you want to come and have a whole week in Scotland, I think this is definitely the week to come uh, to come and see what's happening and be inspired, hopefully. So, thank you. First of all, I guess I'd like to thank Sarah and the RDC for uh, asking me to speak. I've been involved in this project for... for uh, but it's seven years and, and probably for three or four years before that on another similar kind of project. And it's been a terrific experience for me and I, I, I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm going to um, just talk about the conventional building approach and the wiser building approach. We've taken a radically different um, view of, of building and we've the, the process and path we've taken on this, creating this building has been really very different uh, to, to your, your regular one. So uh, th these are pictures of the boiler house as it was. Um, so the conventional approach would just be to knock it down, uh, to avoid any risk or any complication with the site, and, and to start with a clean slate. Um, and uh, I, I guess uh, that's the, the general construction practice. Um, so we... We, we took a much more enthusiastic uh, um, approach to it. And I guess we're all enthusiasts here. Um, and the, jet, the conventional approach, I guess, is taken by people who don't come to um, conferences like this. Um, so uh, we, we decided to, to keep the structures. And that, I think, has a big impact on, on, on the site and the building. We, but we kept the, the chimney, even though we, we have plans to use the chimney, we don't have any money to use the chimney at the moment, but, but we've just retained the, the, the site, it's the, the natural element of the site, and the memory of the site, it's, it's not just about the, the bricks and mortar. Um, so these are very early sketches that myself and Rowan and Glynn did in 2011, and we threw the kitchen sink in terms of ideas at, at on the, we just put, put it down on paper. So some of the things we had was harvesting the pipes out of the building and making a green screen. We, we wanted to reuse a boiler and make it into a canopy at the front door. And we, we wanted to have different kinds of materials that you could test and, and research. And, and even though the building looks kind of different, all of those ideas are still here and in some shape or form. We've had to make some pretty... Uh, I guess, difficult compromises along the way, but we've tended to hold on to the ideas, which I guess is the important thing. So this is what we started with. Uh, we kept the frame. We, you can see all the cross bracing here, and the building needed to upgrade the frame to current standards. But, but keeping the structure of this building is a 100 or 150 year decision. Th this structure can last that long easily, um, but, for example, in Molser Street in Dublin, there are, have been four buildings, I think, in the last three years, completely demolished and completely rebuilt into buildings that take the same form and they're the same size, same number of storeys. Um, so, I mean, if, if we can 
think uh, in terms of a 150 year decision when we des- decide to invest uh, socially, I guess, in a structure, uh, we need to just think about that, that it can adapt. We just need to build in a little bit of flexibility to it. And, and it's there for a long time. It can be reclad quite easily. Um, but these things tend to be disposable. Um, so the next thing we did was we, we clad it, and we clad it with, with sustainable material as much as we could, and I'll go into that in a little bit de- more detail. And then the other thing we tried to do was keep the site. So originally we had planned to demolish the reservoir because we didn't think we could use it. But actually when we actually got inside the reservoir, we realised that we could use it, and, and we had to change the site plan and so on. And again, try to keep all the ideas we had about using the site, but, but retain the reservoir at the same time. So the conventional way of building is, is, um, is based on the objective the builder has uh, to realise a project, to build a project and to turn a profit. Um, so uh, it, it, it's not in his interest to, to do things that are complicated or slow. Um, he wants new, fast, easy. He, he wants mass-produced stuff. Uh, he wants stuff that's easily certifiable. He doesn't really care where it comes from. He just wants it delivered on the date, um, if it's the right price. And the impact of any of those materials or any of those processes isn't measured or isn't considered. And on the face of it, I guess, that's the way things are. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But um, in our building, in this building, we've taken a very different approach to, to those things. So. Um, we uh, looked around in Ballymun at materials that we could reuse. So there was a housing estate, a housing scheme across the road on the other, just uh, the opposite side of the shopping centre. Part of that was being demolished. They had this sheep's wool insulation in the roof of that building. It was just going to be thrown out. Um, but we were able to collect it. Um, and I guess the rediscovery staff did, did most of that. We packed up plastic bags. We organised it for, for it to be stored in a DCC depot um, and we reused it in the walls and ceilings outside uh, above the offices. Um, and what we did there was we retained the value of the material. Um, and it sounds kind of easy to say that, but most of the time we don't. Most of the time, as soon as we touch something for the second time, we're reducing the value uh, of it immediately. So this is a, it, was, it didn't cost us anything. Um, it was, it was going to be thrown in a big hole. It's a natural material that performs very well. Um, but it was actually very challenging to do something like that. It sounds kind of easy, but there was a lot of roadblocks in, in the way of doing that. Um, another material we used was wood fibre insulation. We used that all on the north elevations over there. Um, so this is external wall insulation. Most of the time, uh, people use petrochemical based uh, insulation materials to, to do this and um, it, it's, it's actually easy to use wood fibre in the walls. We found that it's much more difficult to use wood f- or sustainable insulation materials in the ground or on the roof um, but the wall was certainly one that we could easily use. Again that's a, um, a sustainable material and that's an exa- example of re- a recycled material. Um, we also had uh, fins on the building. I think someone mentioned that the building was designed to lose heat. So um, we collected these fins and we used them for um, cladding. Uh, you'll see it on, it's just on this wall over here. And it's an unbelievable finish. It's a, I think it's a beautiful finish in the building. That's an example of upcycling a material. Um, and again, it, it, uh, there was a little bit of labour involved. And uh, you know, we had to take them down, we had to collect them, we had to be careful with them, we had to cut them. Um, but uh, it would, would have been easier just to get virgin aluminium, bend it and cut it and get someone else to do it and deliver it on site. But um, it, the impact of, of all of that stuff is, is not measured, uh, where reusing the thing, again, is, is, has a much better impact. Um, this, uh, th- these windows, we, we have a couple of, of reused items, the brickwork on the, on the ground floor is one, um, but this is a supplier window again from that uh, housing scheme that was demolished across the road. It is actually a very clever uh, domestic window system uh, that preheats your ventilation air um, passively. 
uh, and we, want, we had a whole bunch of these. Uh, we could have used more if we had more storage space. Uh, we weren't able to use them on the external layer of the building because we couldn't certify them, so we, we reused them inside. Um, and then the, the other layer of, of material is sustainable material. So you, you can see it all around us here. So all of the walls are made of timber and hemp. So all these things are, can be grown, can be grown again, can be, can be replaced. Um, and more importantly, when this building gets demolished, you can crumble this stuff up, add a little bit more water and lime and, and make it all again. Um, uh, and we also try to focus on local materials. Uh, I guess this is a, a bit of a hard luck story. This is a picture of Ballymun um, when, uh, in 2012, I think. And you, you might be able to just pick out some of the flat blocks that were due to be demolished. About 90 or 95% of demolition waste is crushed concrete material. Um, and we needed some of that for the, 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 the site here. And Ronan, I guess, spent a, a lot of time organising all of that to happen. And um, contractually, it, it wasn't, hadn't been allowed for, but we managed to broker a deal. But it, it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was the, the guy who was organising and we, we'd been discussing with was sick the day the delivery was due to be made. So, um, I mean, it, it's uh, one of those things that you, 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 think it's, uh, you think it's a done deal, but, but something trips you up. Um, and and you, it, some of these things are, because they're unconventional, are, are, are difficult. And, and the last thing, we worked with Tom Woolley, who, who generated a, um, a, a tree hugger spec. So, th so this is a spec for the building where all the materials that we used had um, a low environmental impact. Um, again, some of these materials were very difficult to source um, and, 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 and procure. Um, and from a cost point of view, they tend to be more expensive. And so we, ha we had to make compromise along the way, we weren't able to use everything we, we wanted to do. But I guess in, in trying to do these things, you learn. And if you, if you don't, never try them. Yeah, you'll never find out. Um, in terms of heat, energy and light, the conventional way is this is, is money point. And I, I guess um, the boiler house here was part of that system where you ship in coal or oil, you burn it, and you, you connect your building to the grid and then you add a gizmo to, to comply with the minimum regulations that, that you need to do. Um, in, in this building, we took a very different uh, approach. So we uh, tried to generate as much of our energy on site as we could. We tried to demonstrate that all of these energy cycles are closed loops. So for example, in, at the back of the building here, we have a stove. We have willow growing around the, the um, reservoir. We plant a coppice, the willow, we have been coppicing the willow and burning it in, in the stove. We can measure the amount of, of energy that contributes to our annual energy uh, requirement. Uh, and so when people come, we're able to say, you see all that willow there? We'd need 50 times more of that if we wanted to power this building purely with biomass. And so we're able to you know, show people what's, what's involved. So we have an air source heat pump. Uh, we have a CHP. We wanted to have a biomass CHB, but we couldn't get one the right size, so it's a gas-fired one. Um, we have uh, solar, thermals on, uh, uh, solar thermal panels and PV panels on the roof. If you stand over there in a plaque, you can use our periscope to have a look at them. Um, and th there's other future opportunities which we haven't been able to take account of. So wind, obviously, is uh, Ballymun is, is one of the windiest places in Dublin. Uh, we have a big, tall chimney here that we could stick um, a, a turbine on. We could also, also use gravity, so we could put a water tank in the, in the, in the chimney and, and generate electricity by dropping the, the water down to the, the floor again. And so this, uh, this discussion go, goes on and, and um, the management of that system has actually proved to be quite a challenge. Um, so you can see little monitors around the building measure all this stuff uh, and try to uh, adjust the, the building systems to, to be as efficient as possible. Um, Olin has spoken about water and waste, so Olin was, was instrumental in, um, in the systems we have. So again, in flushing the toilet and uh, letting someone else clean up after it, it's the conventional way to do it. It's, it's stuff we don't really want to talk about or deal with. Um, but again, we've taken a, a very different approach. We've, we look at water and waste as, as a resource, as, a, as something that's of benefit to us. That's something that we can use 
right on the site. So in theory, I think we can uh, collect rainwater from the roof, we can use the foul waste to generate compost, and we can deal with all of that on site. Now, in, in fact, some of it goes down the mains, but, but um, it's possible to do that. And we only actually use a very small area of the site to deal with that stuff. And then all of the water that comes out of the reed bed um, gets reused in the, in the garden and, and other places around the building. So it's, it's a real example of something that's icky and gooey, smelly, and, and it's something that no one wants to be near, uh, actually being something that's incredibly useful. Um, after all, we're, we're made of water. I, I don't know, are we 70% water or, or something? Um, uh, the, 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 I heard someone um, recently uh, speaking about uh, the cost of flood mitigation measures in South Dublin County Council. Um, and they've spent so many you know, millions in installing these, these flood mitigation measures. Um, and, and people go, oh, you know, mad money to put into that. But it's not when you consider the damage of, of flooding, the, the, the cost of repairing a flood. I mean, the, the cost of repairing uh, the pollution in our water table, uh, some of that stuff is irreparable. Um, the cost of it is astronomical. But I mean, we, we didn't get any credit for dealing with the waste on site. But the benefit to the, the mains are the, the, is, is, I think, quite considerable if everyone took that, took that trouble. Um, so I guess a lot of those things are closed loops. You can see the urine treatment uh, thing out the window here, and the reed bed is, is, is out the back. Make sure you have a, a good look at it on, on the tours. Um, and then the final bit I'm just going to hand over to, to Sarah on this. So um, the conventional approach to finishes is you cover it up. Uh, here we haven't, uh, and we haven't because we want to learn from it. So Sarah can talk about all the educational opportunities in the building. Thanks very much. So hi everyone, I'm Sarah Clear, I'm the Education Manager here and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. It's really, really great to have everybody here and also to be able to show you around our fantastic building as well. So thank you all very much. So, so what I'm going to be talking about here today, I just want to talk a little bit about this building, the Wiser Project itself and what it is, what it's going to do. So this building here is actually what we call a 3D textbook. Now, I've always found that adults find this concept a little bit harder to get than kids. If I say this to kids, they go, oh, you're in the book and you're learning from it. It's like, yes, that's it, exactly. I work with kids a lot. So um, um, with the 3D textbook, we actually learn all of our lives, as we all know. But we also learn not only from somebody standing up in front of us and speaking. We also learn from the built environment the natural environment and the cultural environment, so the people around us as well. So when we were designing this building and when we were designing all the different elements of it, we took all of these into account as well. It's all about promoting behavioural change from, those, from the learning environment, the built, the natural and the uh, cultural as well. I'm not tall enough to see over, sorry, I have to peer over. So this whole building itself and the Rediscovery Centre are set centre of excellence demonstrating the benefits of low carbon living and resource efficiently at all levels of interaction. So basically it's all about inspiring sustainable living at every single element of it. Um, as Dara was saying, from points of view of water, our waste, energy efficiency, all those different things we've taken into account as well when it came to the designing of the building. The building itself, as you're walking around on the tour or even sitting here, some of the seats that you guys are sitting on would have been upcycled from waste, demonstrating um, the circular economy and how you can do it as well. So what we've done within the building itself was take a couple of these points and make them our bookmarks, which are basically learning opportunities within the building. Now, we've only picked out about 35 of them, but really the whole building and everybody in it as well is all... A, all bookmarks and all learning opportunities. When it came to the bookmarks, some of them were quite simple. So when we were talking about um, people being able to see the solar panels and the solar thermal heating on the roof, we can't get people onto the roof. How are we going to do that in a simple way? Basically, a mirror 
and a plaque on the floor. You can look up, you can see it. Uh, you can actually see what's heating the hot water in the building itself as well. Um, when you're doing a tour around, somebody's going to be telling you more about that. You have different levels of interaction. So with a four-year-old, I'm going to explain it differently to a to that what I'd explain it to uh, an expert as well. So it's always going to be different when we're interacting with it. Um, some of the other bookmarks um, were about the building itself and all the things that Dara was talking about. So our living wall out here that the kids call amazing but gross. Um, so that's a really, really nice one showing urine recycling and actually getting people to interact with that as well. Um, some of the other ones we weren't able to show quite as simply within the building, so we actually developed them. One of the particular ones I wanted to talk about was our water cycle machine, something that was a real team collaboration, something that we're all extremely proud of, I think. Um, so it's not really on showcase today, but if you come back another time and have a visit, you'll be actually be able to see it in action. So what we were trying to do here was, because we've got so many different elements in the building that are all around our water efficiency and using water as a resource, we wanted to be able to show all that within one small machine as well, called the water cycle machine. So we debated a lot about how this is going to work. We spoke with a lot of educators, with children as well, with different focus groups. So it was something that we did a huge amount of research, and you can see a picture of us here having big debates about it. Then there's my uh, not so great drawing there that you see as well, planning the whole thing out. Dara's amazing technical drawings here as well. So it was a real process that we went through over a year and a half, two years really, to, to get this far as well, just with this one machine. And now when you see it now, it's basically you can pump the water and actually see the water cycle in action. You'll still see the sun and the clouds over there. So with primary children, we can talk about the water cycle, how that all um, happens. There's other elements as well involved where you can talk about water pollution. What happens to our water when we flush it through? Um, fluid through our toilets, where does it go to? There's no water treatment. So there's a huge level of interaction. And I've seen so many grown-ups playing with that as well. There's also three different uh, videos that we have uh, on different, again, different kind of uh, information all about water pollution, how we use water, and the water cycle itself as well, a little bit more in depth. So just to talk about some of the other bookmarks, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I just wanted to showcase a few of these here as well. So one of the really fantastic ones that we have that was very kindly um, funded by the EPA, thank you for that, um, was our What a Waste bookmark. I love my acronyms and my cheesy lines as well, so everything's cheesy named. Um, so it's just at the back of this one just here. So this is our pledge tree on this side and the far side is our uh, What a Waste. So basically it's all about interaction with waste to show what happens um, with reduce, reuse, recycle and um, uh, and landfill as well. So they're basically cubes that you can rotate, you can interact with, you can get a lot of information in different levels. For younger kids, there's just small bits of information, actual physical objects in there. For older people, um, there's a lot of writing or more technical information in there too. Um, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking to a gentleman, I just happened to be passing by and I got chatting to him and he was just saying, from this one piece of information about coffee cups and how much waste that generates every year, he was going, I am actually never, ever, ever buying coffee in a cup again. I'm making sure I'm buying, I'm going to get one of those reusable cups. Really, really small, but it's all these small changes, small behavioural changes that make a huge difference as well. So it's kind of from the bottom up is what we're trying to do here too. Um, even our waste bins around the, uh, the centre themselves as well are actually made from reused waste. You see a fantastic one that was designed by the bike team that um, is actually a bicycle wheel with the tyre on it that keeps the plastic bag on it. That's the bottom, the bottom one there. Um, and our seats downstairs in the education room as well are actually made from uh, reused plastic crates and they where the furniture team tops in them, the fashion team made uh, designed uh, covers for them as well. They've all got matte symbols so we can, it's a showing, showcasing waste reuse and it's also showcasing how we can use mats and mats is in our everyday lives as well. Um, just a few more of the water bookmarks. So we wanted to showcase, because in the building itself we actually um, harvest rainwater on the roof and that's actually used to flush the toilets. We wanted a smaller one that people could interact with that was, that's outside. So in one of the sheds outside you see a small rainwater harvester that's actually made by reusing plastic bottles um, and again we can use that as a teaching tool all around water efficiency but also things like um, 
uh, gravity, showing the effects of gravity and things like that, lots of forces and things. Uh, there's also a picture of our um, reed bed system, so recycling of wastewater doesn't have to be gross, like Dara said. It can also be very pretty with yellow flag irises there too. Thank you, Olin. Um, and this is a few more of the, uh, our bookmarks as well. So outside, we've actually used the whole space outside as an outdoor classroom, not just for kids, for every single member of the public from four to 104 that comes here. Everything is a learning tool from our bug hotel to our amazing um, green wall outside as well that provides space for biodiversity, uh, increases, uh, improves the air quality and uh, dissipates the heat island effect in cities as well. So absolutely everything is a learning tool here as well. And you can see a lot of uh, pictures there of kids interacting with all of these, including our green roof outside as well. That's something that people um, really enjoy and really enjoy actually seeing, because usually it's on a roof, you never get to see it. So it's nice to be able to touch it, feel it, pour water on it and see what happens as well. Um, okay. So in terms of our wiser education as well, we do a huge range of different um, education from our visitors and just interacting with our visitors to primary workshops, secondary, third level. We work with a lot of special needs groups as well of different ages. Um, we do a huge amount of educational tours as well. Usually if you come to visit the centre, um, you will get some kind of a tour, some kind of interaction from some of our staff as well, which uh, helps out with the cultural element of the learning environment. Uh, we also run teacher CPD workshops and adult practical skills workshops as well and they tend to be hugely popular particularly showcasing how you can turn your waste into a resource whether it's fashion whether it's bikes or furniture as well and these are just some of the different topics we're increasing these all the time because we always get Myself and Roberto always get really excited by all these different topics, sustainability topics or circular economy, so we're constantly evolving. Um, and one of the ones that's extremely popular for all ages as well is our creative reuse workshops. So you get to be creative and it's sneaky science learning as well, so which we always like to get in there too. Okay, and this is just a quick overview as well of some of the different workshops and events that we did in 2017. So we work extremely hard. We work with lots of different ages, lots of different people as well. So in the education department, we delivered 333 workshops. So both here on site and we also do outreach workshops as well in schools or libraries or at events. Um, so we had um, 7,831 participants in our educational programmes. That's not including people that would have come to the centre that we would have interacted with as well. So it's quite, quite big as well and increasing all the time. Uh, we also have... Uh, we also enable a lot of research with third level institutions. The building itself, we, there's uh, 500 data collection points within the building, all about water use, uh, energy and waste. So all of that data is actually available as well to students that can actually use this for project to study, to help them learn and grow and also to help all of us. Um, I always say young people are obviously our future and the more changes we make in their thinking, the more we can make a change our future as well. Um, so these are some students who were doing a, a project last summer and they actually came up with a fantastic idea for using a chimney as a um, wind turbine. So it was basically integrated wind turbine where the wind turbine on the chimney was going to be able to power uh, your stove downstairs. So it was all about, and I mean, these guys are 15. It's absolutely incredible to see where this can go as well. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're really proud of in terms of um, showing the impact of our education was this project by TY students in Presentation College in Bray and Wicklow. Um, it was on the health and well-being of the entire community is what they called it. So they came here on a visit to our centre um, in about October. Yeah, October. Um, and they, had, they were telling us that they just created uh, this project in Minecraft, which is an online kind of building thing. I wasn't that familiar with it, but they told me all about it. So basically they created their school, a scale model of the school in Minecraft and they were trying to think about how they could pr improve their school. So we had a, I had a video from before they came and it was really amazing, great engineering, great kind of computer skills that they'd learned. Then they sent me a vid video after their visit. I have never been more blown away in my life. They had included so many elements from here and it just had so inspired them. It's an absolutely incredible video to watch. They had put in um, more, lots more green spaces in there. They thought a lot more about where their waste was going to go, how their water systems were being used, how, how they could um, make it more energy efficient as well. 
Um, and they and I was actually talking to them about three weeks ago. They've gone to the board of management of the school, and they're trying to implement as many changes as they can. So really proud of these guys as well. So I'll, we'll actually put our the link again up on our social media if anyone wants to take a look. It's a nine minute video, but it is well worth the watch. It's really really inspiring. <laughs> So, and what I just want to finish on is the Wiser project is working with industrial spaces to exemplify reuse. That took a while for me to learn to say, but it's all about really getting wiser. And this is a little um, waste collage that was made by one of the kids here just to show us all really by recycling, by reusing, by the circular economy, we're make it, making the world happy at a better place. So on that cheesy line, I'll finish. <laughs> Any questions from the audience on the last two, three speakers? Shane. It's just a quick one for Dara. I was just wondering, were you able to use the sort of skills and experiences you got from here in later, later jobs? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, not yet, should I say. Not yet. Uh, um, I guess uh, uh, I'm, I'm confronting my own marketing uh, gifts. <laughs> <laughs> probably aren't up to speed, uh, but also that the generally isn't, um, uh, people aren't interested, to be honest with you. Uh, an example of that would be, for example, uh, there's, there's um, the passive house, the first passive house was built, I think in 2005 here, maybe a little bit later than that. Thousands of people have visited it. Um, I mean, to date, there may be 30 passive houses in the country. There's many more that are, are passive but haven't got the badge. Um, so it's really only the enthusiasts who are willing to get the badge and go the distance and, and go the extra step. Um, most people are only interested in complying with the minimum regulation. regulation. I had just had one question following up from that really. Is there going to be a kind of how to do it guide for anyone else that wants to similarly replicate uh, this kind of project, given that you spoke about some of the blockages and some of the issues you know, about timing, about storage, about all these other things? Is, is that part of the, the wiser output? Yes, yeah, so there is a material reuse uh, report that we're doing, which kind of um, steps through, it tells a story about all the different the, the, the time frame of the building and all the, the different aspects of it. So, so that will be part mm. of the outcome of the Wiser project, mm. yeah. yeah. Great, thanks. So any other questions now? Everyone's really hungry. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sarah, Richard. Just for Ian, I suppose, I wonder, was there any particular point through, I suppose, community reuse networks, transition to zero Scotland, and through that whole period, was there a kind of tipping point at any stage where you thought, Okay, now this is really happening in Scotland on a, on a you know, wide scale. Oh, it's interesting. Uh, I, I don't know. No, I don't think there was a, a moment in time. I guess you, when you're in it, you don't really realise that things are evolving. Uh, so I guess when you look back, you think, well, yeah, we were in a different place five years ago or whatever. Uh, and I, but I think that for the reuse sector or the community groups, the revolve. Uh, accreditation system for their for their basically shops uh, and their systems I think that was a real probably turning point for a lot of the the interaction suddenly we were they were getting a profile uh, and they were getting more customers and they were getting that at a local level and a national level they were getting the profile so I think certainly from our point of view that was that took a wee bit of time I must admit uh, the fact that we got to a hundred uh, we always said it was about a milestone that kind of seemed to be the moment when we all looked at each other and thought, God, this is happening now. There are now these accredited reuse shops that are now, all of them, visible to their communities and nationally, the brand, but also they'll all turn around and say their footfall has increased. They've got a much, much more loyal customer base in terms of people coming in and out of their shops uh, and all of the benefited from the back office support through things like health and safety, uh, stock control, uh, accessing goods, so that's all linked, all of these revolve shops now that are linked through a kind of phone number, well I say a phone number, it's not that, it's a donation line, whatever, uh, on the websites and, and we're developing an app for that, so all of that is now becoming a bit more coordinated where it wasn't before, so I wouldn't say there was a moment that that all happened, but I think 
yeah, genuinely, that was a that was an initiative that really galvanised community action on the ground. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would I absolutely uh, recommend it. I mean, I think it, it is challenging. I know when you set out on those things and you have a vision of what it would look like, and it does take some time to get there, and uh, it has its challenges. But we are now seeing, and we are, we'll see. I mean, for us, we do a lot of work, obviously, with uh, what do we call it, hotels, and uh, through our other programs or uh, hospitality industry are now there saying, well, hold on a minute, these people, we, we've got beds, we refurbish our hotels, we have other issues. So they see that as a credible network that they would like to engage with, whereas before they struggled uh, with a kind of disparate, with every, with every respect, group of organisations, but now something like the Hilton Group, uh, should mention names specifically, but something like that are really responding, uh, and even some of the other uh, furniture retailers see the opportunity now at a national level to engage with that sector. So. It, does, it is worthwhile, so it demonstrates that uh, through the kind of metric. Uh, and obviously, if you are going to recycle, you should target the things of higher carbon value, plastics, food waste, obviously. So that's what the metric was set up. We've obviously developed that, uh, you're right, more as a, as a policy tool around the circular economy to demonstrate the impact of different, different approaches in the circular economy. So from a, definitely from a macro level, so we used it to uh, support the evidence gathering in terms of the economic things, so we matched that with uh, you know, analysis that if we shifted to a circular economy, uh, so by 2030 we could have reduced our carbon emissions in Scotland by about, uh, I can't remember, 11 million tonnes or something, about over nearly 25% of our current uh, emissions. Uh, so that helped, you know, in terms of carbon, so that's there. But it's also now available, obviously, for individual businesses, if they're beginning to think so, or modelling work with their individual companies, as well as identifying the value, the economic value we put and plug in the carbon metric and what they're planning to do, and it comes out a number. So it's a kind of, it's a tool that frames the carbon agenda, which is still important, obviously, uh, as well as the economic and the jobs and all that. So we're now creating that dashboard for all our work so we can demonstrate that. Ultimately, we'd like more people to use, more countries to use our carbon metric. Uh, we think it's, uh, the, the reason behind that, because I think that's really important, I mean, it's not, it's not us being selfish in Scotland, uh, measuring tons of waste with every respect is, is part of the system failure, I guess, for, for what we've got at the moment. Uh, it leads to all sorts of odd things uh, in terms of our infrastructure. Uh, and I think if we had more people thinking about the carbon metric, more, it sounds a dreadful thing to say, more brains working on it from across a diverse range of countries and disciplines and academics, then it will develop faster and we get more, you know, using all that information that we've got that sits behind it, we'll get, we'll get to some of those answers quicker.